It's Catherine Newmark. I work as a journalist and I am delighted to welcome you here in the Allianz Kulturstiftung in Berlin to the third of our digital editions of the Berlin Correspondences, the Berliner Correspondenzen. This is an event we usually hold in the Maxim Gorky Theatre, but now they are in summer recess, but of course the Berliner Correspondents and they continue. So we have this wonderful space here next to the Pariser Platz and the Brandenburger Tor, a very historic place in Berlin. The Berliner Correspondents and they are a cooperation between the Maxim Gorky Theatre, the Allianz Kulturstiftung, the Humboldt University and the Foreign Ministry. And they, are a, they aim at bringing together voices from politics, science, culture that can help us make sense of our ever-changing world and of the present moment. A difficult endeavor since the present is in many ways so much more obscure than the past. We cannot even look back at it from a distance. It is just a jumbled up mess of wildly incoherent <laughs> events and impressions. And this is probably true always, but it seems to me particularly true in this present moment where the experiences that we are all making with COVID-19, with the corona crisis, are so wildly disparate, even in small geographical spaces and small cultural communities, but even more so, of course, in, on a global scale. So I am extremely delighted tonight to have two really of the most interesting social analysts of our time to help me make sense of this moment. And I will introduce them in a second. I will also tell you, our audience, I'm delighted to welcome you and I would be very happy if you would join the conversation. You can write an email with your questions to the email address info at berliner-correspondenzen.org, info at berliner-correspondenzen.org. The email should also be shown on your screen. My colleague Nino Klingler will read out as many of, as, pos of, as possible of these uh, questions in the end. Und wenn Sie sich jetzt fragen, warum hier Englisch gesprochen wird und den Stream lieber auf Deutsch hören möchten, es gibt einen parallelen übersetzten Stream. Sie, können den, Sie finden den Link dazu in den Beschreibungen Ihres Videos. Now let me come to introduce my distinguished guests. It is a great honor to be joined by Eva Ilus. She is a professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and also at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en de, de, de Sciences Sociales in Paris. And her work obviously widely, widely known on the sociology of emotions and especially on the question of how capitalism has impacted, transformed and even reshaped our feelings and our int intimacy has made her um, an academic known in the, on a global scale. I will just quote a few of the important books that she wrote on the topic. The first was Consuming the Romantic Utopia, Love and the Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism in 1997. Then there was Why Love Hurts, A Sociological Explanation. Or most, more recently, Emotions as Commodities, Capitalism, Consumption and Authenticity or also Unloving, a Sociology of Negative Relations. And of course, Eva Illus has also published on a large range of other issues. And she is a frequent contributor in the Israeli, in the German and in the French press, among other things. Eva Illus joins us from Israel. I am delighted to uh, that you are here. Good evening, Erev Tov. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm and delighted on, to be here. <laughs> And on my other screen, other side of our big screen, there is Shoshana Tsubov joining us from the US. Of course, Shoshana Tsubov, who was the Charles Edward Wilson Chair for Business Administration at the Harvard Business School and one of the first tenured women at that faculty, is best known for her work on what she calls surveillance capitalism and that has become a catchphrase and a concept that we all are grappling with at the moment. She, ha she is one of the most early and most prominent uh, sociologists and economists who have dealt with the problem of how the digital age transforms our personal data and our lives into commodities in a way or um, resources that can be used in an economic way as it has never been done before. She has written three enormously impactful books apart from a, a innumerable essays and also uh, uh, smaller texts. The first one was In the Age of the Smart Machine, The Future of Work and Power, published in 1988. 
In 2002, she published The Support Economy, Why Corporations Are Failing Individuals in the Next Episode of Capitalism. And her most recent work, which came out in 2018 in German and 2019 in English, is The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future, The New Frontier of Power. And it is, in a way, a sum of all of her long-standing work on these issues of big data, internet business, and our lives that get entangled in it. Welcome, Shoshana Zuboff. I am delighted that you could join us tonight, or I actually believe in the middle of the afternoon where you join us from, from Maine in the US. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> it is a pleasure. Uh, I love being in Berlin and uh, with our friends around the world. So thank you so much for having me. Well, then let us, since we have, I now can hear both of you, let's jump right into our topics of debate for tonight. We have, as we have done in previous editions of this, uh, of this format, this digital corona debate that we do, um, divided the discussion into three main topics, which we will sort of introduce each by a proposition that I will read out and that we can discuss. Now, my first proposition is the following. We are living in a strange in-between moment of this pandemic. It's simultaneously getting worse, getting better, getting normal. And of course, this is not as much a proposition as it is a question. Where are we at in this crisis? And it is actually not that easy to see on a global scale because there's a lot of sort of post-corona partying going on, on some, in some places there's this reopening. And on the other hand, there is the resurgence of the virus. And now since we are lucky to have such a large um, distance that we can bridge in this debate, I would just like to hear from your sort of, your perspective and your experience what is the present moment? What is the moment, for example, in Israel, where I believe you still are, uh, shortly going to, back to France, I think, Eva Ilus, but you have a sort of, there's been a, a, an early success in Israel, and now there are a resurgent of, um, of cases. So where is the political and social debate right now? So let me, um, do, do you hear me? That's yes, I do. You, yeah? Okay. First of all, let me say that I'm delighted to be with Shoshana Zuboff, whose work I admire a great deal. Uh, so I'm, I've never met her in person and I'm happy to meet her virtually. Um, and let me shift a little tiny bit your to where we are before I speak about Israel. I think I want to just think with you a bit on um, the situation in which lots of the world is in and, and try to con conceptualize it. So I think, first of all, we are in an unprecedented situation. It's, um, it's unprecedented for the citizens and it's unprecedented for the leaders. In Israel, um, Netanyahu kept using the metaphor of war, um, as did other leaders. Mm -hmm. Uh, Macron did the thing, and in Italy also they did the uh, same thing. Um, that we need to make a small break and um, that they have to reboot the system on some level. I'm very sorry, there's a technical inconvenience. The first topic that I wanted to debate with you was the question of this strange in-between moment in which we are. are we, is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Are we going back to normal? And I would like to ask you, Eva, first, what is your view of this in a sort of a general way, but also possibly since we are in, US, in the USA, in Israel, in Berlin, we have possibly also different geographical and local perspectives on this question. Unfortunately. Um, so, if I try to think about where we are at now, I think we can um, say we are in an unprecedented uh, situation, uh, both for the citizens of the countries and for the leaders who actually uh, were faced, we have to say, with um, something completely unprecedented. They had absolutely no tools or resources to deal with. And um, in Israel, Netanyahu kept using the metaphor of war 
to refer to the crisis, but obviously this is not a war in the sense that, I mean, in many senses, first of all, because it pointed to a sanitary pact and not a security pact, what I would call a sanitary pact between the state and the citizens, but also because I think maybe in a way that was, uh, again, unprecedented, we, we experienced a stillness, a kind of immobilization of life that even in wartime we don't uh, experience. So I would say my first remark would be that at, the, at this very moment, Israel is probably in the same position as many countries, which is that it cannot go back on its um, 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 de-confinement. Uh, it, it cannot go back. On the other hand, a, lo a lot of economic sectors have not uh, opened up. Um, and so there is a state of conflict and tension within society that is uh, growing with many sectors, uh, in particular the tourist sector and the cultural sector being extremely affected and in even the most uh, perhaps uh, affected. So, um, so, so, I, I was, so, so that's, one, uh, that's one aspect of what is happening right now where many people Many groups of people feel actually totally abandoned um, by the state. My second remark with regard to Israel uh, and maybe also many other uh, countries is that, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know if you looked at the results of the French election, uh, local election. Mm -hmm yesterday or the day before and the greens um um scored an overwhelming victory and that was not surprising in many ways because i think that this event this biological event actually places us in a way in the same situation as a you know climate crisis situation that is it's planetary in the sense that it's planetary and it seems to concern some disruption of the natural world and it demands uh, an international coordination. Um, in Israel, it has not been, I would say, in contradistinction to many countries where this has been interpreted um, as a way to advance the green agenda. This has not been the case at all in Israel. Um, in fact, I would say that um, the crisis has been used in Israel the same way as uh, quite often authoritarian leaders use crisis. You know, they, authoritarian leaders either manufacture crisis or they use them when they ar uh, arise in order to advance their political agenda. And this is not by chance that this is now that um, uh, the annexation of uh, some territories, a very controversial annexation, is actually pushed forward. So that makes, if you want, the more general point that um, crises of any kind are very good, actually, for authoritarian leaders and for their agenda. And. Um, Finally, I would say that um, all over the world, this crisis will be an opportunity either to reformulate the uh, social contract, for example, by demanding a greater involvement of corporations in the common good or by uh, stopping the course of the so-called neoliberal state or by democratic democratic democratizing uh, the workplace or by creating a universal basic income. But another possibility, which I think should be taken quite seriously, is that the crisis is going to re-feudalize um, social relationships. And by this, I mean that the high unemployment rates will be used to lower salaries, that normal labor laws will be suspended under emergency laws 
and that um, the debt of private individuals will be very much increased. And debt is in itself, you know, a, a, a way of, a, you know, living under the dependence of uh, institutions and a, the credit institutions and agencies you owe your money to. I um, I have the feeling that it is the second option that we are at now in Israel, and this is the second option to which we are going to go to. So that's my take right now mm. on the situation in Israel. Thank you very much, Shoshana. May I uh, now ask the same question? Because, of course, you live in a wildly conflicting state. I mean, what Eva talked about, the conflict, conflicts and tensions that arise, I think we all see them in America quite strongly. What, has your, what is your impression of this strange post-corona in New York, pre-corona in Texas moment that is going on right now? Mm. All right, well, um, I'll of course uh, build on some of Ava's themes and um, maybe uh, a little bit of contradiction too. Uh, but I love your term in between. <laughs> I thought about that a lot. Um, what is it that we are in between? Mm -hmm. The way I see it, we are in between two extreme uncertainties uh, that are um, not normally in the in the immediate space of our daily lives, uh, and both of these um, both of these extremes are highly uncertain in in a way that does um, uh, that does uh, make the, the prediction process very difficult. So, what are these extremes? On the one hand, what are we in between? we are sandwiched between the biology of a microorganism that is largely unknown. And so the, the facticity, the importance, the significance of this microorganism in our daily lives, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, every conversation with our friends, with our children, the microorganism. But what's on the other side? On the other side are our political institutions. These two things have become the independent variables that define our situations. There is no generalization to be made here except for this, that what we have discovered is that everything depends upon the quality of our political institutions, which is to say the quality of our society and our government. So around the world, number one, and within the United States and, uh, and, and across Europe, we are experiencing completely different realities, largely driven by the differences in our political institutions. So if you live, for example, in New Zealand or Costa Rica or Denmark or Germany, you are experiencing this pandemic in a certain kind of way uh, where there is more uh, trust, more solidarity, mm -hmm. more predictability. And I think where I would differ uh, with Eva is that unprecedented as the situation is, there are tools. And the tools actually have turned out to be pretty straightforward. The problem is that they take leadership, social solidarity, and rational political institutions to implement them. The tools of lockdown, the tools of social distancing, the tools of hygiene, the tools of separation, the tools of providing financial support in a meaningful, stable, and predictable way to populations who are severed from their livelihoods, and thereby avoiding the repealing of life that, that Eva uh, rightly uh, is concerned about. So we have seen political institutions, of course, uh, I think New Zealand is at, the, is at the head of the pack, but 
we have seen political institutions vary tremendously. Within my country, you ask me about life in America right now, as you've already intimated, Catherine, there are vastly different realities depending now on what state you live in. Because uh, as, as we feared long ago when Yates wrote these words, you know, the center did not hold. And so we have a vacuum at the center. We have a hallucinatory vacuum at the center. And that has meant that every state, every governor um, uh, is defining its own more local society and its own more local rationality. And therefore, uh, our lives in Maine are quite different from uh, the citizens and, and friends who are in Texas right this moment. So these two are wildly different experiences. So we're in between these two vectors that are uncertain, that are uh, unpredictable, that n do not normally define our lives, and suddenly everything depends upon the convergence of these vectors. So can if I just I uh, to... interject something? Mm -hmm. Can I just interject? Um, I mean, I completely agree with you, Shoshana, that this is a political event and that the political institutions were crucial in the management of this, seem, I mean, this biological uh, event. Um, I, I would be a little bit less um, radical in the claim that the tools are known and obvious. True, I completely agree with you that the leaders actually who fared the worst, um, Bolsonaro, Trump, Johnson, uh, Boris Johnson, are the leaders who kind of bluffed their way up to power and the ones who are the most likely to use actually fake news. I don't know about Johnson, but I mean, certainly Johnson is a master at fake news in the same way that Trump is, but um, Trump has no respect for science and I don't think Bolsonaro has either. So there you're completely right. Um, but I am thinking about Egypt, which chose not to lock down people. And the reason why they didn't do it is not because they're not rational, it's because they just could not afford. There are too many poor people and they were afraid of a uh, famine. Um, so there are countries in which I think the solution or the way to go is not clear. Uh, or where there is a very clear trade-off. And myself, you know, when I became aware and when, as we all became quickly aware of the number of people who were going to be um, um, unemployed without a great certainty that the state could support them, then I became extremely unsure about the right path. So I, I have to say that in, for me, the, you, you, you can see a functional, highly functional country like Germany, like New Zealand, when that path was very clear. But there are many countries in which, for one reason or another, that path was not clear. That's a very interesting point. Maybe I can also um, just move on to this. Uh, something that you mentioned at the beginning, Eva, is the rhetoric of war, because I think it's sort of part of the question of how we react. It is interesting which countries have used this rhetoric. I mean, I think Israel and the US are examples for that, whereas we in Germany have never had a war on Corona. We've had a sort of a communal effort. Now, this does not mean that it, um, it wasn't equally hard to do, but I think that there is sort of a framing as well. I mean, apart from the, the sort of the realities on the ground and your example of Egypt is of course very interesting, but also India, which has had a very hard lockdown with sort of a huge fallout for poorer classes. Um, what, the, what is the difference? And, and I think especially also because Eva, you have written about this as well, the sort of dynamics of fear that is conjured up by this metaphor of war where you suddenly, there's an anxiety. Now, I've been always wondering, is this fear only destructive or is it also something that makes people sort of do the right thing because they are afraid? Is there a productive element to the fear as well? 
Um, did I write about it? I didn't know that. <laughs> um, but let me think about your question, which I find very uh, interesting. So, you know, um, if you take the Hobbesian view of fear, then fear is, you know, it's Hobbes and it's Machiavelli. Uh, fear is what keeps the social order together. It really um, uh, is one stream in political thought. And then you have the Montesquieu uh, kind of thinking about fear. Montesquieu thought that fear was a despicable way of governing because it was the instrument of tyrants. It was the ways in which tyrants um, uh, governed. Um, I would, and we have seen this debate in a way come up uh, among intellectuals. There was a debate, for example, between Agamben uh, and others where Agamben took a very strong side against fear and against the abolition of freedom because Agamben, um, is aware that it, it is precisely in states of fear that states can declare a state of exception. Um, now, um, and, and, and other people like Jean-Luc Nancy in front of, you know, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy and others um, opposed him on the grounds that uh, you know, the sanitary pact between the state and the citizens compared the state to do whatever it had to do. So to respond to your question, is there a good and a bad fear? Do I understand the question um, um, correctly? I don't think you can say from the standpoint of the person who fears if there is a good or bad fear. What you can say is that fear can be manipulated. The bad fear is the one, the, is the surplus fear, is the one that is manipulated in order to gain something. and. Um, in Israel, for example, that was very obviously the case. Um, so where, for example, Netanyahu used a, an extremely scary rhetoric to close down all the court system, uh, all the, le you know, all legal jurisdictions in order to avoid his impending uh, trial. Um, so I would say that elites are very good about using fears, manipulating fears, um, but from the standpoint of the person who is afraid, I don't think you can really make a distinction between a, an, an imagined fear and a real one. They feel both extremely uh, strong. The, yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yes, it is very interesting. Maybe I can uh, take this subject of fear on to, to Shoshana, which of course, there are different fears going on. There's the, the, the fear of sort of life and limb, the virus, it could catch me. But there are different fears that have come to the forefront now. And one of them, of course, since we all spend our lives on Zoom calls and in electronic media, is the fear of data privacy, which is, of course, something that has been around for a while, but which is, of course, exasperated now by this, this situation where we are so very dependent on the digital media. At the same time, some people, there is, let's say, a, a measure of fear that maybe would be good in this question, that we should be more aware. We should possibly be less afraid of uh, losing our rights to walk around the streets with guns. We should possibly be more concerned with our data privacy. I, I'm not sure if the, 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 this fear of, of the takeover by sort of electronic media is, is actually widespread enough even. I would like to hear your take on this because of course this is what you are teaching us these days. <laughs> well, uh, le let's call it anxiety. <laughs> and um, you know, anxiety is one of those, um, is one of those things that uh, you need the right amount. Too much anxiety and you're paralyzed and too little anxiety and you're um, dangerously apathetic. So uh, it's good to have the right amount of anxiety uh, for um, clarity, motivation, performance, perception. Uh, and you know, when, when, the, when the pandemic um, first hit, 
It was obvious that the, the tech giants, the great surveillance capitalists, uh, there I, I would uh, you know, include, of course, uh, Google and Facebook, Microsoft and Amazon, uh, Apple uh, coming along in a, in a more ambivalent kind of position, sometimes in, sometimes out. They were ready on the mark, and they're ready on the mark because their systems of hidden uh, surveillance, uh, capturing behavioral data with systems that are designed to keep us in ignorance, uh, all their supply chain flows, uh, growing their artificial intelligence capabilities, their ability to create behavioral predictions, with they, which they sell in their marketplaces, which is what accounts for their uh, huge market capitalizations, especially in the case of Google and Facebook. Um, these systems were so highly developed and, uh, and just ready to expand. So the first thing that happened was, you know, Google Classroom is already all over the world. Um, uh, with the lockdown, that existing line of business expanded dramatically. But it was easy for that to happen because it was already a sophisticated business. Uh, similarly with health data, these companies have been um, moving into the health industry, particularly in the US, that's kind of the, the uh, starting point, uh, with a clear ambition uh, to own and operate healthcare, and especially to own health data, artificial intelligence that will that will um, consume health data. So these systems uh, are are institutionalized. They're they're ready. And when COVID hit, it was an opportunity for them to fulfill those emerging ambitions in a way that. Uh, was literally like a bonanza falling into their laps. So a, a, right at the beginning, there were so many projections of dystopia. I mean, uh, people and critics, specialists, as well as citizens, you know, ordinary citizens are seeing this happen. And the very first theme of conversation was drawing a straight line between these incursions and the growing dystopic kind of vision, you know, that uh, um, everything will be surveyed, the biosurveillance will be ubiquitous and so forth. It, at the very beginning, I felt differently. I felt that there was too much toothpaste out of the tube, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, too much understanding of these systems, too much criticism, too much resistance, too many citizens mobilized, too many lawmakers around the world mobilized. And I think that is what has turned out to be the greater truth. The dystopic uh, potentiality is there, no doubt. But we are seeing an enormous pushback to this, um, to, to the idea that COVID will be the, the new surveillance bonanza that will define the next decade or indeed the next century. And I, and, I, and I think the, um, I'll wrap this up with um, what I think is the, the best thing to come out of this on, on this topic. And that is that by, by having our, our homes become the site of these expanded virtual experiences, uh, which means expanded surveillance capitalist supply chains, in the intimacy of our home, uh, in the midst of our professional life, mediating all of our relationships. We have come to realize in a way that I'm not sure how, how else we would have realized it so deeply and broadly and quickly, that we are literally marching into the 21st century, marching into the digital century naked. That is to say, without the charters of rights, without the legislative frameworks, without the regulatory paradigms, without the institutional forms that are necessary to make the digital century compatible 
with democracy. This is like imagining ourselves, you know, in the, in the 1960s or the 1970s, somewhere well into the 20th century, without child labor legislation, without uh, the legislation that makes it possible to, and the rights to join uh, trade unions, to bargain collectively, to strike, without the institutions that oversee worker safety, consumer safety, uh, all of these kinds of, of uh, rights, uh, legislative frameworks, and institutions were the result of a, of a very fertile creative period in the 20th century that, however imperfectly, made industrial capitalism relatively safe for democracy and subjugated capitalism during many of the decades of the 20th century, subjugated capitalism to democracy. We have shed all of that five decades of neoliberalism, the rise of an unprecedented form of, of digital accumulation and power with surveillance capitalism. We have shed uh, th that, uh, that balancing act, that subjugation of capitalism to democracy. And we now see, I believe, that that is absolutely necessary and that we have to move forward in this next decade with that same kind of fertile outpouring, new institutions, new statements of rights, laws, and, and all the rest of it. Without that, <laughs> we are left kind of, you know, shivering, pulling the thin threads of old 20th century law, whether it's, uh, you know, monopoly law or the laws that we're relying on now, the you know, unemployment benefits and so forth. We're pulling these, these, these little threads around our shoulders to try and comfort us in this new century, but it's not enough, and the real work is ahead of it, and I'm seeing people around the world being mobilized now for that work. So you would say, and this is interesting to me because I, I wasn't sure, because there is two phenomena. On the one hand, I had never heard of Zoom before. Now I know that Zoom exists, that it has been long criticized for privacy issues, and there's sort of a, a debate about Zoom. So it, on the one hand, I'm more aware of the problem. On the other hand, I'm using Zoom a lot. So is there a chance in this crisis? Do you see, or more generally put, do you see sort of this moment as, as, as this moment where we could become more aware and which will actually lead to the things that you want to see happen, these legislative efforts? You know, I've said that there are, there are three, there are 16 reasons that one could analyze in depth to ask, ask the question and answer it. You know, how did surveillance capitalism get away with this, this license to steal our private experience and uh, turn it into its raw materials for uh, manufacture and sales, um, but uh, uh, the top three, uh, number one, the systems are designed to be illegible, they're hidden, uh, ergo the surveillance in surveillance capitalism. Uh, they are designed to keep us ignorant. Uh, most people until very, very recently had very little idea of, of how these systems work, what was going on. But the third thing is uh, social participation. Uh, because we arrived at a point where the leading surveillance capitalists essentially own and operate the internet, and yet the internet has become our essential medium for social participation, we've been in this intolerable situation of no escape, where you know I have to call uh, my children's school to get their grades, to get their homework, and that marches me through surveillance capitalism supply chains with the school's education platform. I need to get my uh, test results from the doctor's office. Again, I'm being marched through those supply chains uh, with my, uh, the health platform that the, that the doctor's office uses. I want to make dinner plans with friends and family. I use Facebook, again, marching through surveillance capitalism supply chains. So intolerable situation. 
Do we withdraw from social participation? No, we can't do that. So what we have to do is hold this paradox that this is intolerable, that it's an outrage, and that we have to change it. Well, this experience of no escape has been intensified. And this is what I, I'm getting at before. It's not just Google Classroom and 60%. Now, you know, we have billions of children all over the world who are forced to march through these supply chains. Uh, and, and the same in, in every domain, Zoom being a perfect example. Um, the, the intolerable nature of this and the sense of righteous indignation has grown as a result of this invasion. The idea that if before there was no escape, today we are completely incarcerated in this, in this experience. So we have with Zoom, for example, it's not that we just use Zoom and, and you know, sort of swallow the bile, but we had such a debate about Zoom, it quickly exited the specialist listservs, got out into the public, and a few days later, two very interesting things happened. Number one, Google uh, decreed that its own employees could not use Zoom for professional business. So that's extraordinary. <laughs> But even more so, the United States Senate said that senators and their staff could not use Zoom, right? So here we have this uh, intolerable situation being heightened and coming to a level of societal consciousness that would have taken uh, a much longer time to achieve. So this is the dialectic. And this is why I think that in fact, what's coming out of this uh, the response to surveillance on the streets of our cities as our people have been protesting. You know, that's another extraordinary thing. Even companies saying we're going to pause facial recognition. And now we're seeing laws coming forth, new bills just this week being put forth saying that uh, facial recognition uh, supported by federal authorities uh, with federal funds uh, we want to make it uh, completely outlawed, a criminal activity, right? So we've achieved something with this dialectic that I think would have come, but would have would have been a, a longer a longer cycle. And this is what's making me feel very very optimistic about our ability to finally take hold and use this next decade to say, how do we reclaim? a digital future that is consistent with the aspirations of a democratic society. Well, I'm very glad to hear this optimism. Maybe if I can go back to Eva, who is, of course, there, the, another aspect of this sort of um, public, private, this privacy issue is that we have gotten used to or not gotten used to conducting personal relationships in the digital sphere and at least in my observation there was a sort of a, at the beginning it seemed like wow at least we can FaceTime and use the telephone but their personal relationships sort of faded with the weeks of lockdown and I found this an interesting observation that I would like to to sort of put to you because this is of course the the question of how intimacy works and how it would work sort of between a sort of a private sphere in a physical sense and a, a, a sort of a internet sphere is something that I've been wondering about how this shift has happened and what has it done to relationships in a, in a very general sense this, this crisis. It's not only made us aware of our dependency on these sort of large-scale um, internet providers but it's also made us aware of how in a way non-anthropological this type of contact is. It's, it is somewhat alien to our species nevertheless, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, contact, physical contact is primary. Um, it's elemental. Babies who are not hugged uh, die or develop with severe neurological problems. So. 
physical contact is absolutely essential to our conception of sociability. And, um, and so in that sense, we can say that this is a crisis that is much deeper than the AIDS crisis, because in the AIDS crisis, um, the virus was trans sexually transmitted, so it was it concerned a very specific act. And quite quickly, it was obvious that if you um, protected yourself with a condom, then um, you were safe, more or less. Um, this virus is different because it, it concerns the entire spectrum of our sociability. So in a way, it is far more disruptive than AIDS was. Not to say, of course, that I'm not aware of the fact that uh, far more millions of people died of the AIDS virus uh, throughout the world. I think more than 30 millions uh, today. Um, and we are still very, very far from that uh, number. Of course, I'm aware of that. Uh, but um, in terms of the normal conduct of our life, the coronavirus is much more uh, disruptive. And this said, um, you can see an acceleration of things that existed before, which is the heavy use um, of, for example, um, internet dating sites, which have become the dominant platform for people uh, to meet each other. Um, only that I would say that their usage has um, been slightly changed with more people, I think, using uh, video chats. Uh, much more than uh, before the crisis. And um, and it's also interesting that uh, from what I could see, I mean, I haven't researched the, the topic. It was, I'm just telling you my, um, my impressionistic observations. It's interesting also that some platforms have um, taken a kind of social role of guiding their, the users through the crisis by, for example, offering a hotline, by offering guidance on how to uh, behave, by saying to people um, that they should not go out and meet the person, their date, but uh, rather than encouraging online um, interaction. So, um, so th this this was new, I, I think. This was new, this kind of uh, new social role and authority almost that the platforms uh, took. That, so that's, that's one remark. Um, the second remark has to do with, um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to say the same thing that Shoshana said, but from a very different angle. Um, the um, great, I mean, I mean, one of the results of this crisis has been to make us uh, adopt in an extremely accelerated way um, many technologies which moved all of our social activities to the home. Um, and so it became really uh, an opportunity to ask uh, philosophical and political questions about the home and to see actually what technology does to us and does to the social bond. And one has to, has to say that it, the, the, the home as it is inhabited by, you know, Netflix and uh, Amazon and, um, and Google, etc., uh, where the world of work and leisure and dating and teaching and shopping, all of that social world moving into a home has highlighted what may be in store. Not only, um, um, not I'm not talking only about the lack of regulation and lack of control and the tremendous power uh, that these corporations have, and which is what uh, Shoshana Zuboff was referring to before, but also um, it made us understand how fragmented in fact, our lives would become and how uh, disconnected from a political and social bond they would become if the home were to acquire the 
uh, stat or the role it has come to acquire. And uh, for example, Facebook announced, I think about a month ago, that, that it was going to move a lot of its work. It was uh, to the home. I mean, it was going to opt for the option of um, of, um, of um, remote work. Um, that's very disturbing to me. Uh, it's very disturbing, and it it is in a way completely congruent with the vision that Hannah Arendt and Adorno and Orkheimer had already talked about in the 1940s and 50s, where they had this vision of a society that would uh, implode, where the political bond would implode um, through a kind of fake privacy and fake because we, I mean, we feel we, we feel we are in the privacy of our home, uh, but in fact, we know among others through the works of Shoshana uh, Zubov, that this privacy is a fictitious one, but also because what constitutes the world, that is a world, what Anna Arendt would call a world, a world where you interact with strangers, in which you forge bonds of solidarity, in which you create associations, uh, in which you create, you create political action. That's the kind of sociability that would collapse under such a world where the home would play such uh, 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 inflated hyperbolic role. So, um, so the, the, the intimacy that was created because people were um, all the time together um, is not an intimacy I relish or um, I think we should aim for. In other words, it's I think uh, the concentration of human activities in the home is deeply contradictory with democracy. That's why I said I would say the same thing that Shoshana said, in fact, from a different angle. The, the point, I wanted to um, just have a, another question to that point because you, I understand your concern then the home office, the homeschooling, the home becomes everything. That that is a sort of, in an R Indian sense, that's the loss of politics because we're all sort of in our intimate little bubble and we watch Netflix in the evening. That's dystopian. But on the other hand, I have observed certain companies in Germany, for example, have relatively quickly switched back to everybody in the office all the time, which is of course a problem when the schools are not yet open all the time. So you get this in-between stage, but it's also a problem concerning people who, who actually quite liked spending certain parts of their time. So there's an ambivalence there that I find interesting because there have been, I mean, there are certain advantages to being able to sort of combine a, a lot of things in the home. I mean, it, it, it's, know, it's a I messy mean, issue. I, I mean, you know, uh, I'm the first to enjoy being at home um, and not to have to run to lots of meetings. And the, the home gives the feeling of being a master of your time and your space and your body. But you know, if there is one thing we know in sociology and political science, it is that what is um, true for in the individual is not true necessarily for the group and that you can have a disconnect. What can be good individually can be actually quite disastrous for the political bond. So uh, again, I'm not saying we should not rethink and this, sh I think again, this um, moment in history is an opportunity to renegotiate a lot of things. We are discovering a lot of things we were not aware of before. And we can renegotiate, for example, the work, the workplace. Um, but um, we should, I think, also be aware of the ominous possibilities contained in uh, a world that would be dominated by those technologies which give us the uh, fictitious feeling that we can handle the whole world from our home. That's my only point. Shoshana, maybe, I don't know if you want to sort of go to this point, but there's one more point I really wanted to ask you, and this is the, this question of the so much discussed tracing apps, which has been in Germany, quite frankly, a, a very long debate and uh, sort of joined by a lot of anxiety. And I found it interesting because the 
The fear was, of course, the invasion of privacy, which is in Germany a, a very strong fear. As culturally, there's always a, a great reticence to sort of do anything in this in this direction. But now that we've got it, I read the numbers from yesterday are that 17% of the population have opted in. It's an opt-in model and there's all sorts of security protection. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's quite a lot of data criticism that one can do, but it is trying as much as possible. Now, this I find interesting because it is sort of giving our data to the government as opposed to big corporations. And that would seem somewhat um, less anxiety inducing at least if you trust your government but at the same time it, 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 what, how do you see this question where do you fall on this question because I have I do know a lot of people who are very anxious to opt into this model and is this because we are also afraid of big data at this point that we just don't trust even a government that we think is quite democratic to do it right what, what is the situation here how do you see this this question of the corona dating uh, tracing app Not dating. Mm. <laughs> this is a this is a this is one of those questions, Catherine, that when you pull on it, uh, literally the uh, the the brief but dramatic history of the twenty first century <laughs> unravels in your lap. Uh, so let me see if I can make a little bit of of sense of this. Um, you know, we have this concept of public health, public health administration. And uh, there are many countries, and Germany is right at the top of the list, where pre-pandemic uh, attitude surveys show enormous levels of trust between citizens and uh, their public health administrations. Mm -hmm. It's true in Germany, it's, it was, uh, it's been true in the UK uh, with the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. Uh, despite everything that's gone on in the UK in the past few months. Um, and uh, many of the countries of Northern Europe, uh, even in Italy, uh, France, uh, very high degrees of trust in public health administration. Much lower in the United States, not surprisingly. Uh, so, so here we have the this public in public health. And uh, public health administrations have for uh, a couple of centuries at least talked about their ability uh, to do effective surveillance when it comes to disease. Mm -hmm. And what they mean is utterly benign in their domain. Uh, they mean uh, tracking a disease, understanding its patterns and its flows in order to be able to uh, contain it and ultimately stop it effectively. Uh, they call it uh, epidemiological surveillance systems. Uh, the first time I heard epidemiologists talking about this, of course, my ears pricked up. Uh, but you know, they mean it in, an, in, a, in a much more benign uh, way that has been institutionalized in this professional space for quite a long time. Okay, so now we have uh, the 21st century. And in our societies uh, over the past uh, two decades, really going back to the very beginning, 9-11, the war on terror, not only American society, but we see this across Europe, we see other countries participating in this, the drift to using surveillance in the public sphere. So uh, now we have the phenomenon of the surveillance society. We have surveillance capitalism in the market sphere. We have intelligence agencies leading surveillance in the public sphere. These have been themes, prominent themes of the last two decades. Now suddenly we need public health and uh, of course, when it comes to a technological application, we have a trust crisis. And we have a trust crisis largely because our democratic governments, and this goes back to my earlier point, that we have failed to evolve the institutions and laws and rights that make our digital era 
also a democratic era. Uh, our governments have failed to do that. And that failure expressed in the surveillance state is, I think, um, a very big part of why so many people in various countries have resisted a contact tracing app that is sponsored by a public health authority because of this fear of state surveillance. Having said that, there's a there's a there's sort of a deeper question here, and I hope a deeper lesson. We talk about privacy and we talk about solidarity as if they were separate domains. When in fact, privacy and solidarity are two sides of the same coin. If we do not have a solidarity in society, we do not have the possibility of the rights, the institutionalization of rights that allow us to think of ourselves as individuals, that allow us to uh, feel entitled to privacy, and indeed to have a right to privacy. All of our rights and all of our uh, individualization is a function of the quality and the solidarity of our society. We cannot have one without the other. This is a very old point, but it is still a very true point. So Apple and Google come along with a contact tracing app. Uh, they claim that it's completely private. They own the operating system. They own the devices. Uh, they own the communication that flows through these devices. Uh, they own the entire communication infrastructure that circles the globe and under the seas. And the idea is that we are supposed to trust an Apple Google contact tracing app more than we trust a public health authority, which comes under the oversight and, government, uh, and governance of democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. This, it strikes me, is a very, very sharp problem. Because what we have here is a one example of a larger, a much larger phenomenon, in which the uh, the the most ambitious way to talk about surveillance capitalism and its instrumentarian power is to understand it as on a course to uh, substitute computational governance algorithmic governance for democracy. This is the idea behind the smart city, the Google city. Mm -hmm. This is the idea they tried to foist upon Toronto, uh, another interesting uh, saga uh, where democracy, grassroots democracy, finally was able to, to push back that threat. Um, but so, so this is part of the superstructure of the ambitions of surveillance capitalism, that we have a market sphere imposing computational governance instead of municipal governance, instead of democratic governance. And, and in this war, this political war between the Apple Google app and what many of our public health institutions were trying to affect mm -hmm. with good intentions with correct intentions. Because if we, as, as, as we've all been talking about quite a bit now, if we can understand the progress of this microorganism on a societal level, mm -hmm. if we can't understand what it means for all of us and how it moves through all of us, we have no possibility of protection for ourselves as individuals. Right? These two things are inextricably linked. So I point to this contest as, as a kind of alert, a kind of alarm uh, to warn us about the larger ambitions of surveillance capitalism and remind us, and I come back to the same point, we need to be able to trust our public institutions. 
And everything that we do in the next decade has to be to put the laws and the rights and the paradigms in place so that trust can be rebuilt, can be strong, can be institutionalized, because without it, everything that we yearn for as individuals is impossible. Thank you for this uh, very clear take on, on this issue. I found that extremely enlightening. I think that we're getting very close to the end of our conversation, and I would like to, if Nino has audience questions, at least one or two audience questions could... Ah, Nino has four questions that he would like to read to us. Maybe you'll bundle them up if you still have the patience to answer them. Yeah, uh, also with apologies for the technical errors, but um, I'm really impressed that um, our audience uh, kind of uh, followed us through all this uh, and um, has some really interesting questions. And they are very directly like uh, um, targeted, so to say, to either one of our two wonderful speakers. So um, I will just start off with one to um, Eva Illus, um, especially. It's a very short question by Priska Mielke. She asks, will we be able to relearn physical contact or will our societies turn more or less contactless and virtual? Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I'm very bad at crystal ball questions and we should remember that if um, we find um, a good cure or a vaccine to this, it could very well be that in a year time or two years time, um, this will be um, an episode of the past, uh, which will have been a, a very interesting one, but um, it will be behind us. So, but this said, um, I think that the temptation of technology now is to, uh, is all the greater, this is something we did not mention, is all the greater that it can offer uh, contactless uh, contact in a way uh, you know if you use uh, robots uh, medical robots for example then the advantage is obvious because the virus doesn't get spread so and this is I think that this is something that Nomi Klein uh, suggests in her um, widely read intercept um, article on the new screen deal um, I think she's right. Um, there could be there, it could be a moment in which technology will be particularly tempting because it is viewed as uh, safer, healthier, uh, because it uh, doesn't um, 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 it doesn't have the uh, disadvantages of contact. But we will. Uh, I don't think we can renounce human contact. So. Um, I think it's, it seems to us that this way now, I don't think, uh, I think in the long term we will have to choose, first of all, where to invest our money, whether in technology or in human beings. Uh, and um, ultimately, I don't think we can do and we will do without contact. But again, I'm very bad at crystal ball questions. Thank, Thank you, you Nino. Much. Um, so the next question goes directly to uh, Professor Zuboff, and it's um, the Berlin Correspondenzen, pardon, the Berlin Correspondence talk is streamed via YouTube, which belongs to Google, which in turn is part of the Big Other and one of the biggest players in surveillance capitalism. So where is for you the red line between acceptable pragmatism and unacceptable collaboration with uh, the surveillance capitalism model? Well, yes. um, you know, it's funny. Uh, the last time I was speaking in Berlin, I, I was asked exactly the same question <laughs> because uh, we were being live streamed and it entailed Google and a bunch of other things. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult question. So I ask myself, should I not come and speak to you? Uh, should I not participate? Do I allow the presence, the ubiquitous presence of surveillance capitalism to silence my voice? My answer to that 
obviously because I'm here today and I was, I was, I was there in November in Berlin. Uh, my answer to that is no, I will not let them silence my voice. Um, in my personal technical affairs, you know, I, I try to operate on channels that are relatively private and encrypted and, you know, I, I do the very thing that I hate and that I find uh, intolerable which is uh, the idea that we have to look for ways to hide in our own lives, to hide in our own lives. This is unacceptable, and yet we do it. So my answer is, I will come, I will be present. If I have to march through that channel, I shall do so because I want my voice to be heard, and I want you to hear it, and I want to connect with you and through the connections that we make and that you make with your friends and that they make with their friends, uh, ultimately this will change. It will have to change. This is not sustainable. Uh, so that's, that's the way I think about it. Thank you, Shoshana. Nino? Here. Thank you very much. Maybe one more question. One more question. If um, which, is, uh, which came from an anonymous source. Um, and uh, the question kind of connects to the one we had before but it's going um, open to all of us. Companies like Coca-Cola, Unilever and others are stopping their advertisements on social media platforms which do not implement efficient strategies against hate speech. How do you assess these kinds of initiatives? Do you think um, that the private sector is taking more and more responsibility or could they do even more? Uh, would you like me to go first on that or yes, how did please. you do that? Yes, okay. So look, um, in my view, this is a great thing and long overdue. <laughs> um, we need all kinds of pressure on the social media platforms. You know, I think a lot of people understand at this point, um, hate works, incendiary speech her, uh, works on these platforms because they draw engagement. They are very sticky. The more engagement, the more behavioral data is lifted out of those interactions, the more it's, the more those supply chain pipes are full, the more you, that's how you end up with, uh, you know, Facebook writes about the fact that its artificial intelligence hub uh, ingests trillions of data points every day and is able to produce six million predictions of human behavior every second. All right. <laughs> the contribution of this very sticky kind of content on social media uh, is, makes it, that makes a big contribution to the, the volumes that are going through here and how essential uh, those volumes are to their business. So, um, so we need to stop that. It needs to be outlawed, it needs to be interrupted, uh, and there's going to be a process to get to that. Um, and part of that process is pressure from the demand side. So what's on the demand side? We have users, and a user boycott would also be great. Uh, what we can do individually as users is pretty limited, but if millions or billions of us were deciding to withdraw, that would be fantastic. Advertisers are another demand side group. I mean, they are uh, responsible for the trillion dollar market capitalization of Alphabet slash Google and the nearly trillion dollar market cap of Facebook, although it, it's declined in the past few days thanks to this, uh, thanks to this campaign. So demand side pressure is essential and I regard this as a very important development. Um, the advertisers made a devil's pact a couple of decades ago when they were sold the idea of online targeted advertising from Google. And the idea then was uh, a clean break with advertising's past. They used to decide where their ads would go consistent with their brand values. The Google pact was you have to take 
the computational advice that comes out of our black box. We will not open the black box to you. But if you accept what comes out of the black box, this click-through prediction, um, you'll make more money and we'll make money, everybody will be happy. That's how it played. And those became the first markets to trade in human futures, which are characteristic of surveillance capitalism and became you know, the global juggernaut that they are today. We wanna break that. So if advertisers are finally realizing that they lost something so essential in that devil's bargain, and they must have it back if they are to control the destiny of their products, of their brand, of their relationship uh, to consumers. Uh, let's get that back. Let's take the black box out of it. Let's forget about targeting. Let's forget about micro-targeting. Let's say it's illegal to sell futures of human behavior, just the way it's illegal to sell human organs or human babies. Then we rip the incentives, the financial incentives, out of this economic logic. That's what clears the space for not only a whole new landscape of competition, uh, but for uh, an economic and commercial future uh, that doesn't uh, depend upon illegitimate, uh, illegal uh, surveillance, uh, the taking of our lives without our knowledge, let alone our permission. So this is great. We need more of it. Let's all pressure our brands. Let's all pressure those companies we do business with. Uh, get into this. This is the right side of history, and you should be there. Um, this is, of course, a wonderful ending. Nevertheless, Eva, I know we need to finish. Eva, if you have one last thing, thing you would like to add, I would give you the closing word. <laughs> No, no, I have nothing to add. I think we it's a are, wonderful way to end. It's a wonderful way. We know what we need to do now. We just need to do it. And we need to get on the right side of history. I want to thank you both very, very much for your insights and also for your patience with our thank technical you. difficulties. I am very sorry. I apologize. It has been a bit of a messy evening, but a very insightful one and a very enlightening one. Thank you both. Thank you. Ava, it's been wonderful to be with you. Um, I hope same we get here. to sit in the same room. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. I hope we get bye. to sit in the bye. same room. <laughs> and of yes, course, to you, bye. I want to thank our audience as well for their patience and for staying with us, even though there were so many interruptions. And I want to thank, of course, the Allianz Kulturstiftung, who organized this, and our partners, the Maxim Gorky Theater, the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Humboldt University. And now, good night. Please take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.